Hey everyone, so we're nearing the end of our Spirit Equip series and I hope by now you've become convinced that so much of the life of Christ that God wants for us is the life of His Spirit. I mean by definition, the church age is defined by the life of God's Spirit. And the same Spirit that was at work in Christ is now continuing the work of Christ today in and through His people, the church. But you know, so much of the tone of scripture is about the positive way we can engage the presence and person of God in his spirit. But scripture also speaks about how we can resist and even grieve the spirit of God. You see, when we want to grow a new skill or learn new habits and ways of doing things, we can learn by what to do. And most of this equipped module has been about what to do. But we can also learn positively by learning what not to do. And so while today we may be concentrating on what not to do, the point is actually to help us grow positively in our engagement with the life and power of God's Spirit. So firstly, let's talk about grieving the Spirit. This is something Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 verses 30 where he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Now this idea of grieving God's spirit comes from Isaiah 63.10, speaking of the Israelites who rebelled after the Exodus. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, and so he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. You see, Isaiah is getting us to think about how God saves his people, God comes into their midst, God is creating a new identity for them, taking them into a new future, and yet their response time after time was sin and rebellion. And so the big idea of grieving the Holy Spirit is connected to our rebellion and our sin. And it grieves God because sin separates and we lose out on the full benefits of relationship with God. Another word in scripture for how we can resist God's Spirit is we can quench the Spirit. Now remember one of the images for God's Spirit in the Old and the New Testament is that of fire. And so this is the perfect word for You know, he has God's work, he has God's life, and we can respond to it in such a way that we actually quench God's spirit, like throwing water on the fire of God's work. Now, the place in scripture we read this is in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Now, I know we've spoken a lot about this. But just hear the gravity of this, that we can despise in certain ways and certain ways that God is working. And in this case, we can despise the gift of prophecy. You know, when someone prophesies or someone shares something in church or life group, and instead of saying, yes, we're going to be wise and discerning, but eager for what God wants to say, we snub it, we reject it, we scorn that in our hearts and our actions. And and this is huge because we land up quenching the work of God's Spirit. Thirdly, the scriptures speak about resisting God's Spirit. Acts 7.51 says, You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Now check out the context of this verse. The Jewish leaders are literally about to execute Stephen for the crime of pointing out how they were acting in exactly the same way their ancestors did, which was that, Every time God did something in their history, every time God spoke, they resisted, they chose their own way, and often actually executing the prophets who wrote the very scriptures they were supposedly so committed to. I mean, that's scary, right? That we can become so blind to what God is actually doing that, yes, God may be disrupting us or challenging us or maturing us or calling us to repentance, but we might get to the point where, well, maybe you say, well, we'll never kill someone, right? And maybe you're right, but we can still actively oppose God's work while feeling so righteous about it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this fourth one because it requires a lot more time than I've got today. And I've already made a full video on this already, and I'll include the link in the description below. But this concerns the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we see this, for example, in Matthew 12, verses 31 to 32. And here's really the essence of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, aka the unforgivable sin. And this is to be so hard in your heart that not only can you not see the power of God in Jesus, but you refuse to see it. 
You see, the idea here is not that there's a sin that God cannot forgive, but rather it's when someone's heart is in such a place, they are incapable of repenting and therefore will never be in a position of being able to be forgiven. Now, another spirit quencher is number five, and that is legalism. And this is pretty much what the whole of the book of Galatians is about. Paul says in Galatians 3 verses 2 to 5, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you have heard? Now, the heart of Paul's appeal here is that not only does no one get saved by obedience to the law, but no one's Christian life is sustained by the law either. And we don't access God's life in the spirit by our own human efforts and legalism. Now, Paul has some super harsh language for this here, and you can go on and read it for yourself. But I think one of the biggest dangers of legalism is that it can appear so spiritual. And so spiritually mature. But man, oh man, Paul's saying, listen, legalism as opposed to faith and the life of the spirit is really going to cut you off from so much of God's life and freedom. Now, whenever we talk about legalism, people always get worried that Paul or I and saying that righteousness doesn't matter. But if anything, this leads us to point number six, where Paul says later in the book, he says, living according to the flesh leads us away from God's spirit. In Galatians 5.16, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, living by the Spirit doesn't lead to doing whatever you want in the name of freedom, but doing what the Spirit wants, which does lead to a fruitful and righteous life. And of course, the converse is true. Living by the flesh ultimately leads to not experiencing the inheritance of God's life and God's kingdom. And the crazy thing about this one is that we can do this without even caring without even knowing that this is what we're doing. Ephesians 4 verses 18 and 19 talks about becoming ignorant of God's life and insensitive to God's spirit, meaning I ultimately lose the ability to sense God's spirit, to respond to God's spirit, to experience God's spirit. And the worst is I don't even know it. Now, the final one I want to speak about is maybe not as obvious as like, you know, killing one of God's prophets or willful sin, but it's really being meh. You know, number seven, being indifferent or apathetic to the things of God. Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You see, the opposite of zeal is disinterest. The opposite of spiritual fervor is indifference. And I guess the challenge here is in the midst of things competing for our time and our hearts and our attention and our affection is not to become indifferent to the things of God. Because that will ultimately cause us to lose out on so much of what God wants to do in our lives and may even cause us to go down some of these other paths that we've just spoken about. And so as we wrap up here, maybe instead of grieving God's Spirit, we desire fellowship and relationship with God's Spirit. Instead of quenching God's Spirit, we eagerly desire His gifts and His works. Instead of resisting God's Spirit, we become responsive to His Spirit. Instead of blaspheming the spirits of God, we become repenting, always turning from sin in our own ways and turning to God's life in response to his voice. Instead of a life of legalism, we turn to a life of freedom in God's spirit. Instead of living according to the flesh and our sin, we live a life of spiritual fruitfulness. And finally, instead of being indifferent to the things of God, we have a healthy spiritual zeal and passion for the things of God, which can be nurtured, by the way. You see, each of these words describe a kind of repentance, a turning from and a turning towards, ultimately towards more of God's life, love, power, and presence.